Hello, everybody. As Alex said, I'm Cara. I'm always in Berlin. <laughs> um, I will be talking about the structure of event level data today. Uh, and bo before we kick off, I think the first and probably most important thing is what is event data? Obviously, at Snowplow, we talk a lot about this. Um, but before I kind of say what we mean by that, maybe does anybody want to have a go at defining this? Otherwise, I will go. So I think for us, <laughs> don't be shy, that's OK. Uh, we can have a discussion about it afterwards. Um, so I think for us, it's really data that captures each action a user or service. So it can also be a machine performs at any given point in time with the corresponding state. And so event data can really take many forms, obviously, like immediately people think of a page view, a link click, maybe somebody viewing a screen in a mobile app, but it can also be a user kind of moving uh, a spot in a call center queue or somebody switching the channel on a smart TV. Um, lots, of, lots of forms um, this data can take. But that also means it can be structured in many different ways and different tools um, over time have taken a different uh, approach to this. And so tonight, maybe we want to look at a simple example of a, a user shopping on an e-commerce site. Most people are familiar with, with this experience. So let's imagine that a product team wants to track some basic events in the purchase flow to understand how customers are, are going through that process and maybe also to optimize the conversion rate. And so you have uh, a simple example. Somebody's browsing the site. They maybe uh, click on some product detail pages, view products. They'll add those products to their cart. Maybe they'll check the cart, see everything looks correct, and then they'll purchase. Um, that's kind of the ideal flow. Obviously, they can be backwards and forth, but that's the, the process we'll, we'll be looking at now. Um, so what would this kind of look like if you had your data structured in a fixed schema, a common approach, for example, by Google Analytics or other uh, software vendors? Um, so imagining here you've got your timestamps of the different events. You might have a session ID. You might have some other fields that describe the user, the browser, marketing information that you have about the event. And then you might have some fixed columns that describe the actual interactions that are taking place. So you'll have the page view at the beginning of the, the, the overall page, and then you'll have the individual product views where you might want to capture as a property what pro, uh, product was viewed and the value you might define the price of the product that people viewed. The next thing will then be the cart, uh, adding the product to cart. So again, you're using maybe the first field to capture what is, what is being interacted with, the second um, to capture the interaction, and then again, um, you might want to add some additional information about the product that's being added to the cart. You now, when the user then views the cart, you have a, a little bit of a dilemma because you maybe want to capture the total amount of, of value in the cart. Um, so you might say, actually, we've got this numeric field here, we'll pop it in there. Maybe not so great because you now have this slightly weird situation where here the value is the price of the product and here the value is uh, the total price of the cart. In this case, it's the same because we've only got one product in the cart, but in certain situations it might be different. But still, I mean, this looks pretty straightforward. You've got your kind of flow from here to here with timestamps, with session IDs. You've got some additional information. Looks pretty simple. Looks great. So what would this look like uh, using more custom data structures that describe what, what the user is doing? So again, you have your timestamps, your session IDs. You might start defining some own events. So instead of having that fixed schema, you might start defining um, a cart interaction event. And then you might start defining some entities that you want to capture that additional information. So just as we had the shirt and the price before, um, you now have that as a, as a product entity. Um, and so you can see um, you've kind of removed the problem here of, of having the, the value of the uh, the cart and the value, the price of the product in the same place because you've now got a separate product entity where you can capture the price and you've got a cart entity where you can capture the total value of the cart. Um, but I mean, to be honest, it looks a little bit more complicated. So you might ask, why, why would we go through all of this exercise? This looks a little bit more work. You have to define all your custom data structures. The other one was ready to go. Um, that might not be the, the easiest way forward. But let's now go fast forward six months when the product team would like to start tracking additional things. So now conversion rates looking pretty good, but now there's a big focus on internal search. So you want to understand, better understand why, how customers are searching on your site and what impact that has on, on um, purchases. So maybe the conversion rate from when people actually find a product and then go and purchase that is pretty good, but maybe some users aren't finding the right products and therefore they're not, they're not purchasing. So then again, let's, let's look at how now 
we would map um, searching in sort of a fixed schema with, with a, a set number of fields. So now again, we'll, we'll probably stick to the, the category being the main, uh, the main thing you want to track. Maybe again, the pages and the, the products people are interacting. The action again, uh, pretty self-explanatory. You might start adding a label to be able to identify different types of pages. So obviously, um, you, you probably want to distinguish a page you're on a home page versus a page you're on a results page because it's a pretty different uh, experience for the user. Um, again, you want to maybe add the, the product. Uh, you now want to add um, the keywords. So in the property, now you say, well, actually, here we want to add the keywords that the, the user is searching. So maybe the first search they search for shirts, they uh, get six results, as you can see here. The, that will be the value. Maybe that's not quite they're looking for, so then they refine their search and say, well, actually, I only want to see white shirts. Um, they see two, um, and then maybe they, they go purchase. So you can already see a, a, a problem start to emerge where the property field is now being used both for the names of products and the search keys, uh, keywords. The value field is being used for the price of a product, for the total value of the cart, and now also for the total number of search results. So um, again, while this might seem really simple, anybody who's familiar with data modeling can already see that this is going to be really hard to, to build any reports of. And also, the information sent with search results is kind of limited. So going back to here, like you know how many results were, were sent, but you don't really know which ones. You don't really know what order they were in. So then let's look at what you can do um, if you're willing to kind of design your own custom data structures. So you might, again, you'll have your event name, the types of events that you have, in, and now you might, uh, for the search events, you might define some additional properties. So you might say, actually, we want to have the keywords as a nice array. Um, obviously, if you're using Redshift, you'll probably have to shred that out in separate tables, uh, but this would be what it would look like in Snowflake. Um, so you'll want to have the specific keywords that were searched for at each point. And then instead of just capturing the total number of search results uh, that were displayed, you might actually want to capture the specific products that were um, that was uh, displayed after every search. So we'll have a, maybe the first search was just for shirts. So you'll have a white shirt, blue shirt, striped shirt, different prices. You might even say, well, actually, we'll extend the product entity with a position field that gives us the exact position that it was in the search results. So we can see maybe if the position that a, an item is being displayed at will affect whether or not people click on it. Um, and so here you can really see how custom data structures um, help you to better run uh, for, for teams in different points in time and, and different teams. Like imagine how this will um, extend if you suddenly have marketing team wanting to track stuff, other teams wanting to track stuff, um, how they all can collaborate and they can take ownership of what they want to collect because all of them can go in and say, well, actually, we want to define some more things. We can see what data structures are already there. We can add to them. Um, but it ensures that efforts are not being duplicated. So we're not having one team define um, so maybe going back to the, this one here, we're not getting another team to like, make up some different way to capture all these search results because they can see actually <coughs> the team that did the, the product analytics already has the, the product entity. We can use this um, and we'll, we'll maintain uh, the same meaning across. And this brings me to the second point where if you have a centralized data meaning where like, different teams can use the same entities and events across, across time, then that allows companies really to democratize that data because everybody knows what it means uh, because that meaning is centralized and enforced through the data structures that you have. And so really, in essence, structuring, a, the, structuring your data well means that it allows you to maintain data quality because um, also another point that you can probably see with, uh, with these um, fixed schemas is that you, you're relying on people's conventions and what might look the same to a human might not look the same um, to a machine. And the next thing is you can um, maintain data meaning because um, in, in different places and at different times, companies can refer to the same centralized data structures and can imply them in their data collection. Any questions? <laughs> yes. So do you recommend using Snowflake instead of Redshift? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends. Um, so, <laughs> um, I think depend, it, it depends on your data volume. I think at large volumes, redshifts can be difficult. Uh, it depends on your use cases also, what type of data you want to collect, whether having all of the data in one central table where different custom data structures adjacent 
is more useful and more easy to use for your analyst versus having lots of different tables for, for custom data structures. Um, it also depends on the amount of queries you want to run. Like Snowflake, you, the, the compute and the storage is, is split out. So um, if you're running a lot of queries all the time, then Snowflake can get quite expensive versus Redshift. You know you have a fixed cost and you know what that's going to be. Um, we tend, I mean, we have customers using both. I think um, the general feedback is Snowflake is, is easy to use and it's, it, it's great to get started and it's really fast. Um, but I think at lower event volumes, it can be more expensive. At higher event volumes, it can be cheaper. But again, it really depends on how you use it and, and what frequency of data loading you do, et cetera. Yes? What advice would you give anyone who's moving from that kind of old format to world, the new structured world? How should they think about that? that I think the, the first thing is, it's nice to have an idealist scenario where everything is really nicely structured, but in practice, often scrapping everything and starting again is, is really hard. And so maybe having an approach where you map out everything you currently have and you map out everything you'd like to get to, and then iteration by iteration, you move one thing over to the other so that every time you implement something new, maybe you already go with the new framework and then eventually you have everything in, in a nice new structure. Um, because I think sometimes things can get a little bit idealistic and it's nice to have things in a, in a nice format in, in an ideal data model, but also, you know, the, People still at your desk every day asking for, for answers, asking for reports, and you can't be like, well, sorry, I, I need to first restructure everything for six months, and then you can come back. So I think iterative approaches is, is good. Yes? Can you say that data is red more than it's written? It depends, I guess, what you, as you say, where it's going to be read and by whom it's going to be read, because I think the first application for most data that's being collected is always going to be building a report, <coughs> analyzing it, understanding it. And there, like it is probably it's nice to have the data structures, but one might argue that it's a lot of effort to build them when then like all you're gonna do is like take that data, put it into one table, have a report. Maybe that's maybe that's not um, worth the effort. But if you think maybe a year or two down the line you wanna build some data driven applications and suddenly you have one data point coming in once, but five um, five outputs, you've got report going out to your management team, you've got marketing looking at it for their um, bidding, you might have a, a real-time engine optimizing your site, you might have an anomaly detection that checks for, for bot attacks, um, then suddenly the ratio of reading to writing can, can topple over, and if you prepare yourself by, by setting this up early, then, then that can be good. Is there an that correct that you discourage to use the standards no flow tracking again? In the implementations that we do, we tend to not recommend using the structured events, rather using the self-describing events, yes. All right, so would it make sense to have a standard library for something similar to these standard events in a custom structure then? So we have some self, like newer uh, Snowplow out-of-the-box events are schemed, like for example, the link click, like the site search, like the form tracking, so um, we do, we do do that internally as well, but I think the the main thing is that like our customers, because we're quite a horizontal <coughs> platform, we have customers and open source users in pretty much any vertical and business model, and so it's really hard for us to say. Obviously, we could say if you're a retail company, you probably want a product entity, and you probably want a cart entity, and you probably want a purchase event. But um, I think probably. Uh, any retail company can also write those themselves. I think for us it's been the work we've done in the last kind of one to two years has been a lot more around coming up with methods to reliably translate a certain type of website or user experience into a, a tracking design that makes sense for various applications. So I think we've thought more about the process than we have about making out of the box uh, implementations for different verticals, for example. But it is a fair point. Yeah. <laughs> well, we started using them and it was like overwhelming if you have the choice right, to do whatever, and then he was like, okay, now, is there some best practice or some recommendation? <laughs> mm, no, okay, then you gotta, you know, think. No, and we, we understand that, and so we do, we do try to encourage people to think about the events and entities in a modular way, so you're not just making these massive custom events and endless of them. Um, but to, to rather say have a few core custom events, a few core custom entities, and combine those to make a very wide variety of different custom events, um, combining those two. Um, and we do appreciate that sometimes there is good uses for structured events. Um, they're very easy to use, but we have seen tracking spreadsheets that span quite
quite a lot of tabs <laughs> and a lot of confusion. <laughs> Actually, uh, this would also be my, my next question. Uh, if you go deeper at just like supporting the semantics of that, uh, I'll come out as saying I think contacts are some of the best things in Slope Explorer now ever. Uh, we use them super often, frequently, but uh, we already figured that there are, there are quite kind, kind of a lot of different usages for them already. Like we have kind of event extensions where we just like want to cram more stuff into an event and self describe. We have actually contextual contexts where we have kind of the same thing that we use in different events like a title or some business aspect and then we have such things as uh, session based context where for example login context or some other stuff basically where, where a user card came in SEO or push notification or anything um, so the tracker currently doesn't support any session based context we currently have to do that um, ourselves so I was asking are there basically uh, uh, in the works of, of making that a little bit more semantic and making the trackers support them as well, uh, like uh, session-based context, for example? So I think I'll, I'll let Alex speak to this as well, if, if he wants to. <laughs> but I think, so one thing to note that we are, well, that we have moved into that direction a little bit with our newest, um, well, the, not the newest, but the one before that, JavaScript tracker release, we've introduced the concept of global context, which are contexts that you define at the tracker level and then get automatically attached to any event. So this is, for example, your user context, any experimentation, anything any that you want everywhere, you can now initialize when you initialize the tracker and it will automatically be added to all subsequent events. And it actually also allows you to specify <coughs> some logic in there that can like for example decide which events to attach and oh, that's cool. I didn't even so, know that. so yeah so the, this is this is new <laughs> yeah, it, yeah the, you're right the context is super powerful to spec out and we're doing we're doing more to make them easier to use and um, just to tie it back to uh tooling earlier so when they're talking about um using launch darkly and attaching experiment current experiments to events um i, I don't know the details but i imagine that would be by attaching context to each event that's how we do it as well yeah yeah and that's super powerful because it literally means you've got all of your AB testing information inside the event as well. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,